Welcome to Capturing the Real Photography and, and Archaeology. So first we will discuss what is an archaeological photograph through the history of archaeological photography and photography in general. As archaeology and photography are both projects and products of modernity and they have extensively exchanged metaphorical weight throughout their complementary histories. So while archaeologists have considered photography as an attractive and ostensibly transparent way to quickly document sites and art artifacts, critics and theorists of photography have drawn on archaeological metaphors to describe and understand photographs. In describing Joseph Nisiphor Niepce's earliest surviving photograph, which is actually a heliograph, taken in 1827 of a rooftop in France, Graham Clark declares it not so much an image as an archaeological fragment due to poor quality and representation. And indeed, it's actually really difficult to see my alma mater, the University of Texas, has this uh, helograph in its collection. And it's very small in a darkened room, and you can only really see the kind of ghostly outlines of what he was trying to capture. Interestingly, Niepce created um, negatives, so dark where there should be light, and then they would darken all over, brought into the light. He then used bitumen, naturally occurring asphalt, uh, that was used by artists to make etchings. Um, and I really love that he used bitumen to fix these heliographs, because it's one of my favorite archaeological substances, if we're going to designate such things. And the earliest known use of bitumen is dated to 40,000 BCE, and it was used by Neanderthal populations as hafting materials to fix handles to their flint tools. So there's a little bit of an archaeological connection there. So Susan Sontag spells out this relationship, stating that photographs are, of course, artifacts. They turn the past into a consumable object by slicing out this moment and freezing it, giving people an imaginary possession of a past that is unreal. John Berger expands on Sontag, acknowledging that photographs are relics of the past, they're traces of what has happened, but he champions creating an alternative photography wherein photographs are contextualized, situated through social and political memory. And Roland Barthes further obscures this relationship between the photograph and the reality of the past, so-called reality, by stating that the reading of the photograph is thus always historical. When you're trying to interpret it, a, a photograph, then this will always be seen through a historical lens, which seems fairly obvious to archaeologists, obviously, but people can use photographs as a sort of indelible um, uh, art of, of a, a proof that something may have happened. This is a daguerreotype taken in Paris in 1838, and it renders the people in it unseen through the use of long exposure photography. And in the very bottom left of the corner of the photograph, you can see the two fragments of people, the two that are actually left over, and it looks like it was probably a person getting his shoes shined, um, and they were still long enough to be captured by this photograph. And so the, this, through this example, I try to show that the use of photographs as evidence has always been suspect and will continue to be suspect as we encounter things. We go back to our illustration week now to see how archaeologists have been making images into evidence. And we can directly tie this to the birth of archaeological photography. One of these very early photographs uh, is by Fox Talbot from The Pencil of Nature. And you see the visual similarities in trying to uh, assign and to classify different artifacts or different things through photography. The visual presentation is very similar. Fox Talbot, the inventor of the calotype process in 1841, was an antiquarian and took photographs of manuscripts, engravings, and busts. So this, the bus of Petroclus, was one of a series of 61 exploring light and angle. So this is a Talbotype applied to hieroglyphics, but if you look closely, you see that the hieroglyphics are actually backward, so that they would have had to be flipped to interpret them. 
And although this photograph of an archaic Assyrian cuneiform tablet was taken by Roger Fenton later on, and not by Talbot, it was one of the series that was owned by Talbot and used by him in his attempts to decipher what was then a lost language. So photography was very much seen as something that could directly transmit archaeological evidence and really aid in bringing artifacts back from where they were in the so-called ancient world back into the life of the antiquarian where they could compare notes and perhaps work towards transcribing and translating some of these things. So further than that, um, Ducamp's photographs of monuments in Egypt, Nubia, Palestine, and Syria during his travels with Flaubert were reproduced in a wildly popular folio, making ancient architecture not only available to the Egyptologists that were wanting to study this, who sanctioned the trip, but also to the French public. Monumental architecture and artifacts aside, photographs of excavations were also produced at this time, but were often used as the basis of lithographs or engravings that were used instead of the original photographs to illustrate books. Photographs of monuments were also used to make interpretive arguments. Salzman's photography of Jerusalem that was explicitly looked by archaeologist Felicien du Sausse to ascribe greater aged artifacts previously associated with biblical times. Salzman contrasts his work to the earlier archaeological recording standard of drawing by stating, Photographs are more than tales. They are facts endowed with a convincing brute force, commenting on photography's putative objectivity and rhetorical force to not just passively document, but actively argue for an interpretive position. And so this is again, photographs are more than just tales, they're facts. In 1881, British archaeologist Sir Flinders Petrie built his own pinhole camera, an issue of Pinhole Magazine, which is now sadly defunct, states, Flinders Petrie's pinhole images from 1881 may well be the earliest pinhole images in current existence. Certainly they are among the oldest and best preserved. Petrie took photos in Giza, in the Egyptian Museum, and in Luxor in 1881 and 1882. This camera was bulky. It was about the size, he says, of a biscuit tin with a sleeved opaque hood and glass plates for negatives. Petrie would carry this camera and a heavy tripod on long walks for 20 miles and would expose the photographs each night, but leave the printing until he got back from England. So it was a very risky model for archaeological recording. You could be fairly certain that your drawings would survive the journey back home, but your glass plates, it was a little bit more difficult. So you were thinking about trading fidelity for transportability. And so by 1906, Sir Flinders Petrie published a chapter on photography in his Methods and Aims of Archaeology. And in 1910s, the measuring scale that is now a defining feature of archaeological photographs appeared and became ubiquitous. So moving on, Wheeler used photography in From the Earth to demonstrate chaotic excavations. So during this time, there was a shift in excavation imagery that culminated in the regimented World War II era excavation photography of Morma Wheeler. With the onset of large scale excavations, the objective to make quantitative, quantifiable documents that could be used comparatively became important in archeology. span So Wheeler imposed strict regulations for site photography using the camera as a scientific recording device and created new genres of archaeological photography and making fieldwork explicitly visible. Wheeler also ushered in a more strictly scientific and objective regime, banning all aesthetic genres of representation, removing the names of photographers from the individual photographs. But really look at the last two slides. He really tried to show the evidence of a chaotic excavation through photography and now this very orderly excavation as he was trying to perform to military standards. As he states, though, the overriding difficulty of the archaeological photographer is inducing his camera to tell the truth. In this, he's acknowledging what many archaeologists have found, that it is actually quite difficult to use a photograph to show what we see in an archaeological site. Oftentimes, 
either shadows obscure what you're looking at or the shades of the ground can't be actually visually discerned through a photograph. So we go back to illustration as being a quite important mode of archaeological recording. But I quite like to go back to this example. Um, so we are moving way, way ahead in time, all the way to 1982, in that archaeology was actually used as one of the first photo manipulations that was widely popularized and widely available. So just as some of the earliest photographs represented archaeological artifacts, Fred Richen cites a 1982 National Geographic photograph of the pyramids in Giza as marking the date when, digital, when the digital era came to photography. The staff of National Geographic electronically moved a section of the photograph depicting one of the pyramids to a position partially behind another pyramid rather than next to it. This scene, as Richard notes, Richen notes, is an already romanticized version that excludes the garbage, tourist buses, and souvenir hawkers. Martha Rosler wondered if moving the pyramids, a symbol of immutability and control, is to betray in history by asserting the easy domination of our civilization over all times and places. The editor of National Geographic characterized the edit as a retroactive repositioning of the photographer a few feet to one side as so as to get another point of view. So while Richen describes this retroactive repositioning as so-called time travel, archaeologists could understand digital editing in alternate ways. Archaeologists who have been relying on this apparent objectivity of photography to record architecture and excavations might identify this as falsification of the archaeological record, while other archaeologists may see it as more of a remix, provided this repositioning was performed reflexively and transparently. The former reconceptualization of photography as an objective record of reality and the current ease of manipulating digital photographs led some theorists to become interested in the so-called loss of the real, the death of photography. This is uh, Lister citing this. With nearly two decades of perspective, it is easy to dismiss these claims as the use of the digital image as evidence has persisted and the low-resolution, pixelated appearance of camera phone photographs and video clips is now an accepted part of the syntax of truthful and authentic reportage, even within archaeology.